So let's continue. And the main, the next thing is we want to find this magic number L, if it exists, and it will. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Such that the scaled and twisted Fibonacci is just sine of NL, and the scaled and twisted Luca is cosine of NL. And it won't be unique because just like ordinary sine and cosine, if you add um, two pi's, then uh, nothing changes, any multiple of two pi. So it won't be absolutely unique, but we'll find a good one, okay, and a simple one. Okay, so how would we figure out what this is? Well, let's go back to almost the basic idea of, there's, there's various ways you could fit, figure it out, um, but let's go back to almost the basic idea of Fibonacci, and that's recursion, okay? What happens if you look at u sub n plus 1? Um, and it turns out, well, we'll see that we, we aren't going to go back to the most basic recursive rule, that u sub n plus 1 is u n plus u uh, plus u n minus 1, but we'll, we'll look at recursion anyway. Let's just be led by what happens by this conjecture. Okay, so u n plus 1, if this is true, then sin, it's going to be sine of n plus 1 times L. Oh, hey, that's sine nL plus L. So that's sine nL cosine nL plus cosine nL sine L. Okay. And what is that? Well, that's UL, UN times cosine L plus VN times sine L. So this is promising that there is a, going to be a nice recursive rule and that for these twisted versions, and that just says the next one should be, you should be able to get it from the current Fibonacci, the next Fibonacci or twisted Fibonacci, um, should be able to, to be gotten from the current U and the current V. And the key is that cosine L and sine L are just numbers. They don't depend on N. Okay, now we need to translate this back into actual Fibonacci and Luca because that's where we actually know something. Um, so we just write the UN plus 1. Okay, that's this in terms of FN plus 1. Okay, and then here's the same thing, UN times cosine L. Here's our definition of VN times sine L. Um, let me re rewrite those on our scratch page. Crucial things. Remember, this is root 5 over 2 i to the n minus 1 fn, and vn is i to the n over 2 ln. Okay, so that's where it's coming from. All right, so if I just take everything off of here, there's a lot of stuff that cancels. The root 5s cancel here, although they don't cancel here. A lot of the i's cancel. So fn plus 1 is fn times minus i cosine l plus ln times sine L over root 5. So this is the pretty version, because everything, when we go into the sine and cosine world, everything's going to be prettier when we stick to u and v, because those are just the sine and cosine. If we insist on translating back to everybody else's language with f's and l's, it's going to be a little less pretty with some 2's and root 5's and i's and things like that. Okay. Now, here's where I pull, want to pull out one more fact about, basic fact about Fibonacci and Lucas sequences. There's a really nice fact about how to get the next Fibonacci number if you have access to the current Luca and the current Fibonacci number. It's just the average of the two. Very, very nice. Okay, let's go back to that. Once again, this is something you can check for yourselves if you're um, skeptical. But uh, if you just take the average, 0 and 2, that's 1. 1 and 1, average is 1. 1 and 3, average is 2. 2 and 4, average is 3. 3 and 7, average is 5. 5 and 11, average is 8, etc. So hopefully that's pretty convincing. It's a good little proof by recursion, uh, proof by induction, if you want, or just trust the pattern here. Okay. So in other words, for this all to work, we need minus i cosine l to be a half, and we need the sine l over root five, which is in front of the ln here, to be a half. So this, these are the magic things we need to have true. Okay. Is there an L necessarily complex that satisfies these? Well, let's just solve them for cosine and sine. So we need a magic L so that cosine L is I over 2 and sine L is root 5 over 2. Now, this really amused me when I was working this out because this related to an observation I, um, I had a long time ago when I was, uh, I teach trigonometry a lot. And, um, and it's this, this idea of the sine of L being root 5 over 2. And I knew it had a connection to the golden ratio, which has a connection to Fibonacci, but I didn't realize how neat a connection it was until um, a few days ago when I worked this up. First of all, though, so I'll tell you that connection in just a second. First of all, we should do a reality check. Um, if there's going to be any L whatsoever that satisfies these things, it's still true that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. That is true even for complex arguments. And so this had better add up. When I square them and add up, it better be 1. Well, yeah, i over 2 squared is minus a fourth. 
root 5 over 2 squared, of course, is 5 fourths. You add those, you get 1. So there's, there's a consistency there. So it's not hopeless that there should be an L that satisfies this. But what the heck is it? Okay, so now here's, here's the deal. If you are just learning your standard values on the unit circle, trig functions, um, you memorize these values for 0 and pi over 6 and pi over 4 and pi over 3 and pi over 2. And you want sine and cosine, but they're, they're the same values in just opposite order. Um, and what are they? Well, it's 0, a half, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, and 1. And this is root 0 over 2. It's an unnecessarily complicated way to write it, but it shows a pattern. Root 1 over 2, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2. Of course, these guys already come this way. And root 4 over 2. That's very pretty. All these very simple special angles, the ones with the, the comes from nice triangles that have nice values, relatively simple, they're all exactly in this pattern. Root n over 2 for, um, for the integers from 0 to 4. Okay. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, what about, I asked myself a while ago, what would it take, oh yeah, right here, what would it be, what would the angle need to be for sine l to be root 5 over 2? Of course, that's not going to work for a real number L, but it does work for complex numbers. Also, this guy, notice this guy, is a root minus 1 over 2. That's if you continued it in the other direction. So these are exactly the ones on the, uh, if you extend this sequence a little bit further than you could imagine it could be extended this way, a little further than you could imagine it could be extended this way. Um, and the funky thing is, the answer to those questions, that cosine is this and sine is this, the answer to those questions are, of course, the same, because they're essentially complementary angles in a complex sense. Um, and it has to do with Fibonacci, as we're seeing. Okay, so that's what this was about. Okay, so um, let's just write it out. Now, this is where it's really useful to use the hardcore definition of sine of L. Oh, this is, yeah, this is sine of L equals root 5 over 2. And just temporarily, let's just let z equals e to the i l. Because one of the most important things about this, and that we'll see um, throughout these videos, is that this is of the form z minus 1 over z <clears throat> over 2i. OK, so I'm going to multiply the 2i as well, cancel it to 2. So I'm really just solving z minus 1 over z is i root 5. Uh, if you want to do this yourself, it's just a quadratic formula. Good practice with complex numbers. Um, you know, pause the video. Put your hand over whatever you can see here. But I'll do it for you. Multiply by z throughout. Move it over. Use the quadratic formula. You get z equals i root 5 plus or minus root of minus 5, because that's this guy squared. You get a minus here, not what you're used to with real quadratics. Plus 4, all over 2. Okay, So that's an i. So there's an i fact, a common factor of i, root 5 plus or minus 1 over 2. Okay, so now surprise, surprise, we're getting the golden ratio coming in, okay? Um, so this is i times 1 plus root 5 over 2, and that's usually to nowadays denoted phi, although it's had different names over the, the centuries. Tau is, was often used. Um, and then often when we're discussing this stuff, we have psi, which is kind of the complementary, uh, it's really the conjugate in a technical sense of the golden ratio, because I'm just changing the sign in front of the square root. Um, and these guys always come in a pair. There's really very few realistic problems that involve the golden ratio phi that don't also, it's in some way, involve its conjugate psi. Because they're, in a lot of ways, they're both really important because they are the two roots of x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0. Um, Good stuff to review if that's not super familiar to you, because um, we're going to be uh, using that a lot. Uh, and so what's the other root here? It's an i times uh, root 5 minus 1 over 2, which is just the opposite of this guy. It's just the negative of this guy. So it's i phi and minus i psi. OK. So again, we have a kind of a choice here. Uh, it's not going to produce anything categorically different if we go with one choice or the other. So I'm going to go with the simpler one, i phi. OK. So we know that z is i phi. What was the point of z? It was e to the i l. Okay, because really we want L. All right, but we're almost done. So E to the I L is I phi. So I L is the ln of I phi. Okay, so that's a pure imaginary number, and we're taking the ln of that, we'll, but we'll review how to do that in a second here. So L is this divided by I, or I prefer to write it as minus I ln I phi. Okay, so there's the magic number. It's pretty cool. It involves three incredibly cool concepts in mathematics. I phi, and the natural log. It's sort of like e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0, which, but is a more basic fact. Um, but 
uh, it's kind of a booted up version of that to to involve phi in the in the in the party. Okay, and so in particular, we've found uh, the answer to this funky question of what weird angle has sine of root five over two. It's this, and we'll make that a little more explicit in a second. Okay, so let's actually write that, since that i in there, because it's inside an ln, it would be really helpful to write that as e to the something. Oh, but of course one of the consequences of e to the i t is cosine t plus i sine t is e to the i pi over 2 is equal to i. That's a very good way to write i. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite it that way. It's minus i times the ln of e to the i pi over 2 phi. So I'm just going to use the rules of logs. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. That's still true, even the complex case. And so I get e, I get minus i, i pi over 2, because I'm taking the ln of an exponential, plus ln of phi. Now that is just a positive real number. So the ln of it is something maybe you've never taken before, but it's not something you can't do. And an ordinary calculator can give you an approximation to it. That's what I have that down here. Okay. So here the i's actually cancel. So I get just good old-fashioned pi over 2 minus i ln phi, and there it is. So approximately one and a half minus one half i, very roughly. That's that this bizarre uh, magic complex number that fits into these angles. So if you if you can say, uh, my I'm thinking of a sequence, 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, what's the next thing in the sequence? Then somebody might say, I don't know, pi, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6, or um, 7 pi over, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and you say, no, <laughs> actually, pi over 2 minus i ln of the golden ratio. Okay, so uh, let's check it. Cosine of l, we better check that that's also the right thing. That's easy. That's e to the i l plus e to the minus i l over 2. That, by definition, e to the i l is the simple thing. That was z, and that's just i phi. So i phi plus 1 over i phi. Uh, okay, 1 over i is minus i, factor out the i, so you get i times phi minus phi inverse over 2. Well, one of the things about phi, you can check, is phi minus 1 over phi, um, one of the things that makes it the golden ratio, is that the difference between it and its reciprocal is equal to 1. And so you get i over 2, which is what we wanted. Okay, so um, I don't think I want to finish quite yet with this video, because I want to actually go ahead and reverse the logic of what we've been doing. Okay, I one of the things I... I don't usually do is start out like I did at the start of this thing with a bunch of stuff that I'm just assuming this is true and not giving you any particular reason why it's true. And again, there's all sorts of ways to, to prove these. There are good ways to prove these uh, these identities uh, from scratch, not having nothing to do with sine and cosine. But now we've used them as motivation and we could just say, well, you know, we've always just been conjecturing these just from maybe just from the data, the patterns in the data. We don't actually know if they're true, but now we can verify that they're true. Because we have the magic number L. Okay, let me scroll down here. Okay, it's getting close. Okay. We have the magic number L. Okay, so we, given L is this funky number, we define un to be the sine and vn to be the cosine. Those are the kind of good versions from this point of view even though they aren't, they're a little uglier in terms of like not necessarily having like integer entries, not having real entries. And um, then we define Fn and Ln in terms of cosine and sine. Okay. Um, and then we run with it. And then we see um, uh, all how those identities work. Okay, so in fact, it's pretty cool. This actually gives us the ability to define the Fibonacci function of any complex number. And there's a few ways to do that. Um, but here's one way to do it. You just put in, put in the Z everywhere you see an N. We know how to take, in principle, the sine of complex number times complex number minus I to a complex number. It's pretty hairy if you've never done a lot of complex functions, but it totally makes sense. And there's a very cool thing. That's an extension of the comp of the Fibonacci and Lucata, the entire complex plane. Not the only extension. I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Okay. Uh, let me just mention, when you write things down like complex number to another complex number, that can be a little dicey as to what you mean. What you usually do to be careful about it is write all in terms of complex exponential, the, the natural exponential function, because that's something that is unambiguous. So minus i to the z I write, once again, I, I write that minus i as an e to the something, okay? And there's a choice here you can make of what angle to take. 
is I've got to find something on the unit circle that's in the down position. So on the complex plane, we know that e to the t equals cos t plus i sine t. What that means is that if I want to write anything that's on the unit circle in the complex plane as an exponential, I'm really just asking what its angle is in radians, and then multiplying that by, ooh, that's an i t. And so I can think of that as minus pi over 2, or 3 pi over 2, or 7 pi over 2, whatever. Okay, so I'm making a choice there, which is kind of subtle. Brings up a lot of good things about complex analysis if you if you ever go in that direction or if you have. So we can re rewrite it as e to the minus pi z over 2. And this is totally unambiguously defined. Okay. Um, so, and I just point out here, you could have various other definitions if you wanted to. So there's there's some real subtleties that I'm mostly avoiding here, but become important when you really take this stuff seriously. Okay. So um, let's come back. We'll come back to that later, okay, uh, just briefly. Okay, so let's check this. What actually happens if you just write this out and use the complex exponential formula for f sub n? We might want to be still a little skeptical. Can we reverse all these steps? And is this really fn? Is this really just Fibonacci numbers that we've created here? And here's one way to verify that. Um, and so I just plug everything in, okay? e to the i l, remember, was i phi. That's, it's not really that complicated. And then putting the n in here makes it to the power n. So here's i phi to the minus n. <clears throat> okay. So um, 1 over i, that's the same thing as minus i, so that boosts this power up to n. The 2's cancel. And then I can factor out an i to the n here. Uh, and then that cancels with a minus i to the n. Here, it's an i to the minus n. That's the same as this guy, so I get a factor, a double factor. Oh, but minus i to the 2n is just minus 1 to the n, which I'm incorporating in here. That minus sign sails through everything. And I get phi to the n minus psi to the n, because minus, five, minus phi to the minus 1 is the same thing as psi. That's a, another important thing about phi and psi, is that psi is um, minus 1 over phi. Okay. There are those conjugates, there are conjugates, but that's also, and it's also equal to 1 minus phi. Okay. Two important relationships between those two. Okay. Now, so what we've done is we've rederived something that is a very, very, very famous formula. That one way to calculate the Fibonacci numbers is called Binet's formula, which is that you take the golden ratio to the n minus the conjugate of the golden ratio to the n and divide by root 5. Um, and so if we already know Binet's formula, that's a good confirmation that we have discovered Fn. If we didn't already know Binet's formula, that's, this is a, a rather unusual derivation of it. It's the first time it's appeared so far. Okay. And similarly for Luca, and then I'll, I'll um, stop this video and go to the next one. For Luca, uh, we write it down. It's, Luca is 2 times minus i to the n, and then there's the cosine of nL. Uh, once again, the 2's cancel, i to the n times minus i to the n cancels out, i to the minus n times minus i to the n gives you a minus 1 to the n, same deal. And you get phi to the n plus psi to the minus n. Oh, plus psi to the n, just kidding. Um, and that's Binet's formula for the Luca sequence. Okay. Um, so, I think that's already kind of a cool thing. It's kind of a weird derivation of those formulas, um, but it's a very, it's a very cool alternate derivation of the Binet formulas. Okay, um, good place to stop. It's been kind of a long one.